We're continuing in the Kings of Judah, and we'll be looking at three kings this morning. So it's a fairly full program. We're going to read chapters uh, 24, 25, and 26 of Second Chronicles. No, we're not. I'm just going to pick a few verses out. And uh, but before we start, just a quick review on the kings so far. We've looked at King Saul then David, and the bracket, numbers in brackets, that's how many years approximately that they ruled. Solomon, and then you get King uh, Rehoboam. Remember, Rehoboam made wrong decisions, and the kingdom was divided in the north and south. So you had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Then you had Abijam, and we're looking at the kings in the south, south part. Abijam, then Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and uh, Azaria and Athalia. Now they're the last three are the ones that Alan looked at last week or two weeks ago. And uh, I'll be doing a recap on that because it's important to get the connection between those three and the ones we're doing, which is Joash, Amaziah and Uzziah. Now, if I do something, if I just put a number in front of that, that's approximately the time that they ruled. And uh, you put the numbers in front and it can be quite easily become a history lesson. Now, I am not a historian. I've already proven that. I am not a historian. I didn't like history at school. In fact, there are only two, two parts of history at school and they said modern history and ancient history. Well, I'd forgotten so much about it, I had to Google it and find out, well, modern history is from the 18th century to present time. And I thought, look at ancient history. Well, I find out that you've got early modern period from the 14th to the 17th century, Middle Ages from 475 AD to 15th century, ancient history from 800 BC to 600 AD, and the numbers up there says that we're looking at between 1000 BC and 800 BC. This is more ancient than ancient history. In fact, Google says that it is Stone Age. And as I said, I don't like history. But I looked up, what, what, what can we learn from history? Madison History Department I hope you know where that is because I don't. But Madison History Department says, tells us that when we study history, it allows us to observe and understand how people and societies behave. So this morning we're looking at these three kings, and we're go I'm going to sort of focus a little bit on that point, on how people and societies behaved in those days, in pre-ancient history. But you know, there's something else here. God wanted us to hear it. God wanted us to know it. That's why he put it in here. If it wasn't important, God wouldn't have it in here. God put it in here for us to learn, to study, and to understand, and to apply what we learn. And also, God wanted to show us how that he was preserving the line for the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. He had a plan that the Lord Jesus Christ would come through these kings, through Judah, the tribe of Judah, and through David. And so today we're looking at three kings, Joash, uh, Amaziah, and Uzziah. Or uh, some Bibles, or some people would say Joash is also Jehoash, and that's when it starts getting complicated because there's also a Jehoash in the northern kingdom. And uh, then you get uh, Uzziah, who's also known as Azariah. But um, I really thank, want to thank Alan for his contribution two weeks ago. He gave us a family tree of, uh, of the group that he was doing. He's gone down to Joash, which is where I am picking up. But I need to just review that because it's good to know and to get that in there in the background to understand what uh, 
just wh where we're coming from. Now, Jehoram, now this Jehoram is the king of Judah. Now, we're looking at the kings on the right-hand side of the screen. So, the uh, Jehoram there, he married Athaliah. She was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Ahab and Jezebel were shocking. Ahab was uh, shocking. Jezebel, remember, Alan says, throw her down, you know, and so on. But Jehoram married Athaliah. So, we've got that link on those two family trees with, through Athaliah. And, um, and then, uh, so that makes Athaliah a grandmother of Joash, the king that I'm looking at today. And this is important because um, Joash, Athaliah does some wicked things and uh, it affects Joash. And um, what happened when, uh, i put my glasses on to read that one, when Jehoram, Athaliah's the, the king, when he died, was killed, he was quite young, I think he was only 22, and um, he, he didn't really have anybody old enough to take his place. So Athaliah stepped up and says, let's kill all his brothers, oh sorry, his brothers have already been killed. We go back a little bit, and Jehoram, when he, when he became king, he killed all his brothers, all six of them. He says, I don't want any opposition. I'll kill all my brothers. So I'll be king in my own, own, my own right. And when he, he died, he didn't have anybody to take over, really. Uh, he had a young... Uh, sorry, Jehoram was a bit older. I'm getting mixed up. Anyway, Jehoram killed his six brothers. And uh, when he died, Athaliah stepped up to the table and said, I'll be queen. And she says, to make sure I'm queen, I'm going to kill all the descendants of the uh, royal family. She says, I'll, I'll just wipe them out. I'll get rid of any opposition. And uh, so, so Athaliah set out, set out to destroy all opposition. And uh, that included, she was prepared to murder her own grandson, Joash. So when Ahaziah died, sorry, when he died. And, um, but uh, Joash was rescued. See the other side there, you've got Ahaziah, and then Jehosheba and Jehoiada. Jehosheba was actually an auntie of Joash. And when uh, Athaliah was going to wipe out that, all the uh, descendants, Jehosheba and the, and the nurse picked up Joash and took him off to the temple and hid him in the temple. Jehoiada was the priest in the temple. And so they, they looked after him. He was only he was probably less than 12 months old. And they looked after him. And Athaliah wiped out the rest of the family. Nice grandmother. Oh. And uh, the, you know, the stories as we go through this, it's really just blood and guts. It's uh, not a real good picture that we're looking at from the history of these kings. And so um, when Athaliah wanted to wipe out the, the, uh, all the family tree, she was in fact a, a tool of Satan wanting to stop the line of the tribe of Judah. He wanted to stop the Messianic line. Wanted to kill off so Jesus could not come. But Jesus had a, or God had another plan. He always has a plan. And he, he promised David, he said, David, you'll always have a king on the throne. You'll always have a king. Right down to uh, King Jesus. And so God prepared Jehoshiba and Jehoiada to uh, rescue Joash and to take him. But in the meantime, Athaliah reigned for six years as queen and uh, incorporated Baal worship and the idols and everything else that went with it. And uh, so she so, yeah, just ruled the roost. 
But what God says he will do, he said he will prepare or will have somebody on the throne from the line of uh, Judah. And so he was protected by uh, Jehoshiva and Jehoiada for six years. And after six years, um, Jehoiada says, well, it's about time we announced to Judah that Je Joash was still alive, that there was a king on the throne. And so he planned for this morning when they're going to have the uh, uh, a special uh, meeting and he had called all the uh, different leaders of the tribes of Judah around the place to uh, this worship meeting at the temple. And he planned the, the announcement. It was going to be made at the change of guard. Now at the change of guard, you've got the guards who have been on duty, and then you've got the new guards who are coming on to duty, so you've got twice as many guards on, and then they had a few extra guards brought in as well. So they, he planned it so that there were guards everywhere. They guarded the temple, and they also guarded the palace. And he brought young Joash, and he stood him in the temple, and he announced to the people, Joash the king is alive. Long live the king. And the people all cried out, Long live the king! They cried out so loud that Athaliah heard it. Long live the king! He says, What's that noise? What's going on? And from the palace she could look down on the temple and see the crowd. Jehoiada had brought them all together without causing any interest from uh, Athaliah. But Athaliah looked down and she said, what's going on? And when they said, Joash is king, you know what her response was? Treason! Treason! She was the one who committed treason. She was the one who wanted to wipe out the royal family. And she called it, said treason. Joash is made king. And uh, Jehoiada is his advisor. And so between them, once he's on the throne, he's been taken over to the palace. The guards have taken hold of Athaliah. And Jehoiada says, take her out and kill her. Kill the people, the prophets of Baal. Destroy the Baal worship, the, the, wherever they worship destroyed them all. And so Jehoiada and Joash, they got rid of Athaliah. And uh, we're reading, as I said, 2 Chronicles chapter 24 for uh, Joash and 25 for the next king and 26 for the one after that. But it, 2 Chronicles 24 verses 1 and 2 says, Joash was seven years old when he was crowned king. Joash did was what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. I'll repeat that. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. The writer here is sending a message. Something's going to happen when Jehoiada dies. He's going to be a good king until Jehoiada dies. And then in verse 4 we read that Joash rebuilt the temple. Now this is, all of this, uh, the 17 verses, first 17 verses, that's over something like 30 odd years. It's not just, you know. But um, verse 4 says that Joash rebuilt the temple. He organised for Jehoiada to collect the monies and to uh, rebuild the temple. It wasn't an easy job because he had to give Jehoiada a bit of a prod. Come on, get the job going, get it done. But he rebuilt the temple. And then in verse 14, we get another warning. He says, As long as Jehoiada lived, burnt offerings were presented continually in the temple of the Lord. Here's another sign. As long as Jehoiada lived, the burnt offerings were continually burnt. There's something ominous about to happen because verse 18 uh, or verse 17 says that after Jehoiada died 
Now we get the, hit, get the crunch. After Jehoiada died, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Now that's fair enough. What relatives were left, they all came and paid homage to the king. The leaders of the different towns and cities around the place, they came and paid homage to the king. You think, well, that would be good. But then they add, and he listened to them. Then he listened to them. He obviously was easily led. He, he, he needed a strong person to help him. He had Jehoiada. As long as Jehoiada was there, he was strong. But when Jehoiada was gone, he was weak. He listened to these men. And what did they do? He said, um, they, uh, verse 18, they abandoned the temple of the Lord God and they worshipped the Asherah poles and idols. The Asherah poles and idols were apparently associated with the Baal worship as well. And so they turned away from God and they started to worship these uh, idols. And uh, because God's not going to let that stand by and watch that happen. Verse 20, we read, the prophet Zechariah challenged them. And King Joash gave the order for the guards to kill Zechariah. Here it is. The good, good healthy uh, argument or discussions here. Who is Zechariah? He's the son of Jehoiada. He's, he's Joash's cousin. In fact, he's probably more like a brother because he was brought up in the temple with Jehoiada. He was brought up in the temple with him. He'd be like a brother to him. And, Je and Zechariah comes and set, challenges him about worshipping these idols. And what's he say there? The king, Joash, gave the order for the guards to kill Zechariah. He said, you dare oppose me? Kill him. That's how you deal with the situation. Don't you? You, you, you oppose me? You, I'll kill you. And verse 22 says on, Joash did not remember the kindness shown to him by Jehoiada. And um, so, you know, it's really a terrible situation here that Joash could turn on the very person who rescued him or the son of the man who rescued him. And I thought, how low can he go? Here he is. Kill him just because he opposes me. You know, within one year, God passed his judgment on, on him. He had sent the Aramean army to attack Jerusalem and uh, Joash was seriously wounded. He was went home, he was lying on his bed to recuperate and some of his um, advisors came in and they finished the job. They got rid of him. Joash started well, but he finished badly. He needed a strong support. He needed a strong arm to lean on. He needed good friends to advise him. You know, a good beginning is no guarantee of a successful ending. Paul could say, I have fought the fight. I have finished the course. Paul went to the finish line. And talking about finishing line, I was reminded as I was preparing this of athletes running a race. You know, and the guy out the front, he's really struggling to get to the finish line. And there's a finish line about three metres in front. And he says, I've won, I've won. Only to be passed before, as he got, gets there. He didn't finish well. Joe Ash didn't finish well. May we keep going till we get and finish well. And then in chapter 25, we talk, learn about Amaziah, the son of Joash. And it says this in verse 1, Amaziah, the son of Joash, was 25 years old when he became king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Once he had secured his throne, he executed the officials who had murdered his father. Well, here we go again. More bloodshed. These guys who murdered their father. Right, we'll get rid of them. 
Now, Amazar means the strength of the Lord. And he set about to restore the kingdom to the greatness of Jehoshaphat's days. So he made war with the Edomites. He defeated them in the Valley of Salt, just south of the Dead Sea. He took their capital and he uh, changed its name to Jokteel, which means God subdued. Then, it's, uh, unfortunately, he also brought back the idols they worshipped and he set them up for Judah to worship. He didn't learn from these father's mistakes. He didn't learn from others' mistakes. You don't worship idols. So God sent a prophet to him. He says, why are you worshipping these useless idols? They couldn't help Eden. Why are they going to help you? But he wouldn't listen to that, to the uh, prophet. He would not listen. But buoyed on by this success, he turned around and then decided, well, I'm going to show Jehoash, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, he's going to teach him a lesson. Now he's, Joash's army is probably twice, as, uh, twice the size of his, but that doesn't matter. He's going to go to... And the prophet went and warned him, he said, don't do it. But he went. You know, the prophet had one last word to, uh, for the king when he went and warned him. He said, don't go up there. Don't do that. He said, God would destroy that king for his sin. In fact, God would let him destroy himself. And the greatest judgment God can send on people is to let them have their own way. And we see this so much today. Needless to say, he lost that battle. Amazar was taken prisoner by Je Jehoash and Jehoash dragged him off back to Jerusalem to show the people there that their king was, was uh, totally humiliated and defeated. And uh, chapter t uh, 25 verse 27 says, from, that, from the time that Amazar turned away from following the Lord, they conspired against him in Jerusalem and he fled to Lachish. He had to flee for his life. And he went to Lachish, which is in Philistia. But they followed him, they caught him, and they killed him as well. Now if we would just seek the Lord before we rush into uh, doing things disobediently, we would avoid a lot of trouble. Even when we change our minds, there are still painful consequences. So after Amaziah's death, Uzziah, his son, who was just 16 years of age, was anointed king of Judah. And verse 2 Chronicles chapter 26 verse 4 says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as Amaziah his father had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord God, the Lord, God gave him success. Uzziah, or maybe known as Azariah, it means strength of Jehovah. And he reigned for 52 years. About the longest reigning king of Judah. One of the longest. He lived in fear of God. He showed himself to be wise. He was active in, uh, and a good religious leader as well. He never deserted the worship of the true God. He was greatly influenced by Zechariah, the prophet. And interestingly, Zechariah is only mentioned here in relation to King Uzziah. And so the southern kingdom rose in prosperity, rose in prominence, and uh, came up to similar days to Solomon, but then we read his fatal error. He was excited by his uh, career in building up Judah. And he determined that he was going to burn incense on the altar of God. And this was only permitted to be done by the priests. Only the Lord Jesus Christ held the office of prophet, priest and king. And his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. 
You can read that in Hebrews chapters 5, 6 and 7. For Uzziah to covet the priesthood was arrogance. He knew the law of Moses. He knew what happened to others who had attempted to do what they were not permitted, like burning of the uh, coals and fire and all the rest of it in Leviticus chapter 10. Look at it, Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 16. So many warnings that the pro- job of the priest is to do the priestly job, not the king. He, this king, Uzziah, was opposed by the high priest. The high priest was Azariah and he had 80 other brave men with him. He went into the temple and the priest and all these other men came up and confronted him and said, no, you cannot burn that incense. You can't do it. He says, I'm king. I'm going to do it. He says, you're not king. You might be king, but you're not a priest. You can't do it. And the king, what's the normal thing? <laughs> Off with the Get rid of them. But before he could do that, God stepped in. And he got leprosy on his forehead. The priest could see it straight away. They knew straight away he had leprosy. If you had leprosy, you weren't even allowed in the temple grounds. I'm assuming that the king also had leprosy elsewhere, for he knew that he had leprosy. And so the priest rushed him out, and he had to spend the rest of his life in exile. He wasn't even allowed in the palace. So, what do we learn? That uh, what we learn from history. What do we learn about people and what they do? As we said, Madison History Department tells us that when we study history, it allows us to observe and understand how people and societies behave. Did you get an understanding of how these people were behaving? How these kings, in particular? I'm in charge. I'll do what I want to do. If you dis- if you if you, you want to oppose me, I'll chop your head off. I'll get rid of you. That's how people behaved. They called it the Stone Age, pre-ancient history. What I see from all this is that I think there should be a warning sign on, in front of the t- palace. A warning sign that says, to be a member of the royal family is a health hazard. Yeah, it, um, it, it, it comes through. If you're, you're a member of the royal family, your life is at risk. So, just to recap, each king uh, killed anyone who opposed them. So it was a danger to be an advisor or worse still, to be in opposition to them. Joash rejected the guidance from his cousin, the priest, and had him killed. Amazar went to visit his brother-in-law, the king of Israel, and was found to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uzziah, well, he wanted to burn incense, and uh, he was put out of the temple. What's the cause of this? There's one thing. I am going to do it. I'm king. I'm going to do it. That's pride. And so we have pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So when you think of pride, do you think it's good or is it bad? No, there are some good, good things to be proud of. Like it's good if you do a good job at work and somebody comes up and says, oh, that's a great job. It's good to do your job well, to be proud of doing your job well. It's not saying, look at me, but I'm doing my job well. Or to live in a suburb where everyone's mowing their lawns and keeping their yards nice and clean to be really acceptable um, and neighbourly, friendly neighbours and everything. That's good. There's pride of ownership. But there's another pride. 
the pride of arrogance, the pride of conceit, the pride of I'm better than you, the superiority thing. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 16, 5 says, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Proverbs 8.13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. He says, I hate pride and arrogance and evil behaviour and perverse speech. God hates pride. Wow. Am I showing pride? I think if we examine ourselves, we probably all show pride in some things. What does the word... uh, how would you sum up pride? He says there, I hate pride. He says, I hate evil. Pride, to me, is equal to evil. In other words, it's sin. And uh, on Tuesday at the, at the men's shed, we were talking about pride. And uh, it was... Re- we're reminded that um, the central word letter in pride is I. It's all about me. I. You know, the very first sin that's recorded in the Bible, you can have a look at Cain and Abel, but I want to go back to Isaiah 14, verse 13. Lucifer. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You hear that? I, I, I. The first sin was pride. Satan saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be like God or be God like like the Most High. Now, a wise father was heard to say, the reason we shouldn't sin isn't because the Bible says not to, or because it's wrong, or because we could get caught out, or because we could mess up our future, or because we miss out on blessings. No, he said, we should try not to sin because it hurts our relationship with God. Sin hurts our relationship with God. Lucifer was cast out because he sinned. Now, we'll never conquer pride. But if we don't know what it looks like, we will be knocked down and uh, there could be damage done. We've hurt people. And if people don't recognise the signs of cancer, they, they, they won't know they need help. So how, this is how one person defined pride. Our self or ego is basically who we are as a person. It's not good or bad. It's just what makes us. Unhealthy pride happens when we do or say things for the purpose of people praising ourselves or for making ourselves feel good or putting ourselves ahead of someone else's self. Pride wants ourselves to be praised, to get glory, to be worshipped, to be highly talked about, even when we're not in the room. Unhealthy pride can give us an elevated view of our own self that is not accurate. But we truly start to believe it and act to reinforce what we've come to believe as true. And when someone questions or challenges the view of ourself as not accurate, the fireworks begin. I'm sure we've all seen that happen. We've just been reading about three kings. They were challenged and the fireworks happened. These are some more definitions of pride that I came across. Pride is being selfish. Thinking excessively about self. Pride's base is too much self-love. Thinking the worth of ourself is higher than it actually is. Self-worship. Pride is self-centred or egocentric. 
In other words, everything revolves around me. Pride wants to keep the focus on self. So how can we control pride? Maybe you've heard the story of the two dogs, but I'll just remind it to you again. Two hungry dogs and only one dish of food. The dog who eats the most is the one who gets the stronger and wins. Pride dog is more aggressive and pushier than humble dog and so pushes humble dog out of the way and eats all the food unless someone purposely pulls back on pride dog's chain. That is when humble dog eats all of the food and wins. Which dog are we feeding? Are we feeding pride dog or humble dog? Here are a few things that we can do to feed humble dog. Be thankful every day by telling God what you are thankful for. Compliment others around you about little things you like. Learn about others and learn to listen to them. You can ask basic questions like, what's your name? How long have you lived here? Why did you move here? What do you do? How did you get interested in that? And so on. This is probably the hardest one. Share your pride struggles with people close to you and ask them to pray for you and tell you when they see your pride, signs of pride. To do that, you have to acknowledge that you have pride and that you have it as a problem. Here's some ways to recognise pride and the different way pride works. Pride of spirituality. We try really hard to confirm the fact that we're spiritual. People should be spiritually minded. God loves that. It's the way we're supposed to be. But when we want everybody to recognise and talk about and uh, talk about us that way, then that's where the problem comes in. So we say and do things for the purpose of reinforcing that we're spiritual. We want to do it to make ourselves look good. The only people Jesus was publicly against were those who did and said things so that people would think they were spiritual. You know who they are? The Pharisees. They would stand up and say their fancy prayers. They would go to the where they pour, give the offering in and put make sure that everybody heard every coin fall in. Look how spiritual I am. It was their image, their self-image or ego that was used to uh, influence people and they want people to praise them for being spiritual. You've got other people, leaders, who uh, end up, uh, I've got here, extreme pride slips in. Public leaders, politicians, politicians who say, I can do that. I'm, I'm, I'm the politician, I can do that. I make the rules for everybody else, I don't have to keep them myself. CEOs of companies who can say, I can fiddle the books. I'm, I'm the boss here, I can do that. Singers, athletes, actors, actresses, we see them all up there. I can do that. You can't stop me. Pastors of churches. Uh -oh. Did you know that the career with the highest rate of adultery is a pastor? I can do that. Pride of spirituality, pride of leadership, pride of knowledge. These people try really hard to make sure people know they are smart. They want a string of letters after their name. It makes them feel really important and important in front of everybody else. The pride of power. This is what we've seen with these kings today. Thinking they were more important than others and trying to make sure people think they were capable. Pride of appearance. 
They try really hard to impress people with their looks and their physique. Some people just do muscle building, muscle building, so that they can be, look at me. And other people dress up with all their clothes and all the whatever. Look at me. They're really trying hard to impress people, to make people believe that they, they are, yeah, they're just selfish. And this is the hardest one. Oh, I'm so humble. I'm so humble. Don't you like me when I'm humble? I'm proud of my humility. That's so easy, isn't it? I'm so humble. We get a false humility. Prideful people, they will fake their humility. They will try extra hard to be humble for the purpose of making people think that they are humble and they'll be praised for their humility. So if your pride pushes you towards performing with excellence, doing your best and finding joy in the accomplishments of others, it's probably helping you become a better person. But if there's any hint of competition or self-promotion, it's probably having a negative effect on your relationships. And these can hurt both your life and your relationships. If that's true, we need to shift our focus from self to others. And in con conclusion, I want to leave this verse with you. You all know it. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 and 15. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their, heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. I put in there in brackets, Harabi. My ears will be attentive to the prayer that is made here at Harabi. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the examples that we can learn from history. We thank you for the examples of these lives of these men. Lord, good examples and bad examples. Lord, help us to pick up the good examples, to follow them and to use them. And Lord, help us to learn from the mistakes they have made. Lord, forgive us for our pride. Help us to be humble for you. Lord, that we would serve you and be humble your humble servants in Christ's name.